Well, we have looked at the future of Israel and her neighbors from the perspective of Bible prophecy. We have heard from dear Israeli and Palestinian brothers uh, on the exciting, even historic things that the Lord is doing in the epicenter right now and the very real challenges uh, that they face. This afternoon, I want to look at uh, the region uh, by zooming up a bit, okay? Uh, we'll zoom out and, and look at what the Lord is doing in five Arab nations that surround Israel, um, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. And we'll look, we're going to spend a little bit more time on them than we obviously have, but I will also, of course, uh, weave in some insights on Israel and the Palestinians because what we're going to be doing is taking a look at the state of the epicenter from, with this question in mind. How many believers are there, really? Uh, I, we've never actually done that, to drill into the data, to talk to uh, ministry leaders in every country, every region, and try to get a sense of where are we right now in terms of the number of believers, best as we can uh, tell, and I'll put some appropriate caveats on that in a few moments, uh, so we can have a sense of where are we now, how, how are we praying, and then over in the years ahead, as the Lord tarries, we'll see how the Lord continues to build and grow this tremendous movement of God in the Middle East. But I've entitled this message, um, uh, while it is the state of the epicenter, this portion of the message is called, Will I Cross the River? Will I cross the river? And let me share with you why. Turn with me in the scriptures, if you would, to Matthew, I'm sorry, to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And we're going to look at a passage in which Jesus crosses the river. Mark chapter 5. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Bible, beginning in verse 1. They, the disciples, came to the other side of the sea. Okay, the Sea of Galilee uh, is, is an interruption in the Jordan River. I mean, it's a good interruption. We like the sea. And uh, if you've ever gone out, if you've been there, it's a beautiful place. to You can, you can boat. You can, you can swim. It's a lovely place. But it's, it, it is the Jordan River above it, flowing through it, and then the Jordan River continues on. So they cross uh, the sea and thus the river. Uh, to the other side, to the country of the Gerasenes, it says. Now, when he, Jesus, Yeshua, got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with chains. Because he had, been, he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles had been broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue this man. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself, himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting in a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he, Jesus, had been saying to him, to this man, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, he, the, per, the man, said to Jesus, my name is Legion, for we are many. Okay, do you understand what's happening here? Jesus is encountering this, this demon-possessed man. And so, Jesus, so the man falls down before him, but he's shouting, you know, what, you know, what, what do we have to do with each other? And, and Jesus begins to speak to him, what is your name? He's not really actually talking to the man. He's talking to the unclean spirit in the man, and the unclean spirit is actually an amalgam of multiple unclean spirits and describes his name as legion, for there are many multiple demons possessing this man. 
And this demon-possessed man began to implore him, it's really the demons in them, in him, implore Jesus not to send them out of the country. Okay? But the demons through this man is imploring him, don't make us leave, don't send us out of the country. Now, there was a large herd of swine feeding, near, uh, feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, Jesus, saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission. Can I just note for a moment that evil has to ask for permission? Okay? God is sovereign. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. So even the demons have to ask for permission before they can do something. Let's just always remember that in the, in the sovereignty of God. But in this case, uh, they, were, they were begging Jesus to do something, uh, to let, you know, don't send us out of the country, send us into the pigs, okay? So Jesus gives them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Now, their herdsmen uh, ran away and reported it in the nearby city, and in the countryside. And the people came out to see what in the world has happened. Right? That's how we began our talk a few nights ago. What in the world is going on? And uh, something dramatic was happening. People come out. Who, who, who's casting out demons and casting them into our pigs and drowning the pigs? I mean, what, what is happening here? Verse 15. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed. And what's happening with this man? Well, he's sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind. The very man who had had the legion, and the people became frightened. Those who had seen it, uh, had seen this, uh, this dramatic uh, exorcism, really, from Jesus, described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man, and all about the swine. And so the people from the city and the countryside who come to see begin to implore Jesus to leave their region. Leave. We beg you. So Jesus is a gentleman. He, he accepts this, and he was getting into the boat, uh, and the man who had been demon-possessed was, was imploring him that he might accompany Jesus. And Jesus did not let him. The text says, but he, Jesus said to him, go, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And so the man went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis, that's the 10 uh, Roman cities, nine of which are on the east side of the Jordan River and one is on the uh, the, the west side, but he goes through the Decapolis, through all these 10 cities, and, and he's proclaiming what great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. This is a fascinating text to me uh, for a number of reasons. There are two parallel texts that are important to note. One is in Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 through 34, and the other is in Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Now, three times in this passage, uh, someone is imploring Jesus for something, right? Did you pick up on that? I'm sure you did, obviously. The demons are begging. And the, word, the, the Greek word uh, for implore is beg, to, to plead. They, they are, they are be the demons are begging, imploring, pleading with Jesus, don't torment us. That's their first request. And second, don't send us out of the country. Now, eventually, they also, they, the third part of that request, I guess, is that, you know, and send us into the swine. Uh, but this is, this is all part of the demons begging Jesus for something. Don't do this. Please do that. The second is the people of the city and the countryside who come out to see what's going on, and they implore Jesus to leave their region. Okay? They don't think, oh, this is so great. Look, uh, 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 this man touched by God, is he a prophet? Is he God? Who is this person who can set us free? 
from demon possession? Who can, who can, who can give us spiritual life now and forever? Who, well, let's find out more about this man. No, no, they want him to leave. So the demons implore. The people implore. The man who is saved from the demons implores Jesus. He implores Jesus that he might accompany him, that, that he, the, the, the man, might accompany Jesus. And let me follow you. Let me, let me travel with you. Let me be part of your team. Because, because he's been liberated. He's been set free by Jesus. And, and, for the, and, you, and you saw the torment he was in. Day and night, he's crying out. He's gashing himself. It's, it's a horrible situation. And yet Jesus has set him free from this. And he knows what's happened. And he knows it's good. And even if the people around don't get it, he does, and he wants to follow Jesus. Please, I beg of you, let me follow you. Let me come on your trip. Let me come on your team. Now, it's important to note that Matthew's account of this actually describes that there were two demon-possessed men. Now, some people say, oh, well, that's a, that's a contradiction uh, because Luke only writes, or Mark only writes that there's one. Well, uh, as Norm Geisler, uh, the theologian, likes to say, well, if there's, one, if there's two people, there's always one, right? I mean, it, just because you write about one person in the event doesn't mean that there weren't two. And uh, Matthew tells us that there were two men who were demon-possessed, and they're both set free. Jesus uh, uh, set, uh, drives the demons out of both of them. But the reason that Mark and Luke focus on the one is because one uh, wants to follow Jesus, and is begging him, Jesus, to let him be on his team. We don't know what happens to the other one. Uh, and I can't say definitively that that person didn't love Jesus for the rest of his life, but it's interesting that one uh, becomes memorialized for you know, the last 2,000 years, and uh, it, it, it's a little bit reminiscent, I think, evocative of the 10 lepers who get healed, but only one comes back to bow down to worship Jesus and thank him and to praise and worship Jesus. And, um, and God points these things out for a reason. And so that's important. Now, it's in, now, here's another interesting element of this text. The demons and the people of the town, the city, the community, they were both granted their requests by Jesus. The only person that doesn't get his prayer request answered positively is the man Jesus saves. The man who wants to follow Jesus. Don't you find that interesting? <laughs> I find that interesting. I, so the text says that Jesus did not let him come. Rather, what did Jesus say? Jesus said to him, go home. Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And the man obeyed. The text says, as we just talked about, that the man went away and he began to proclaim in these 10 cities, these 10 Roman cities, what great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. What, you, what, what I think you can see out of this text is uh, something that's important at, at several different levels. First is, you know, sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers the way we, we want them to be answered. Right? I mean, my wife and I uh, love discipling young people. And um, often when we, we gather a new group of young people to start working with them, we will ask them, hey, tell us uh, your three greatest answers to prayer that you've ever had. Okay? And it's so fun to hear their stories about what God has done in their lives. But 100% of the time, 100% of the time, they tell you yes answers. I prayed for this, and God did it. I, I, I prayed for that, and God provided that. I, you know, I prayed for this door to be open, and God said yes. We said, that's fabulous. And we let them tell their stories. Then we say, all right, here's your homework assignment. Next week, come back and tell us your three greatest no answers. And invariably, they look at you like, what? We said, no, the ones that you said, Yo, I wanted to go to that college, and the Lord said no. I wanted to marry that girl, and the Lord said no. I wanted to you know, get that job, and the Lord said no. And at the time, you were bothered. And then later, you were like, oh, wow, that actually worked out well. You knew better, Lord. Thank you so much. And they don't think that way. We tend not to think of no answers as good. But they are good because God is a good God. He's a great God, and he knows better. Maybe what we're praying for is not necessarily bad, but the Lord says, okay, thank you, no. 
do this. And what he wants us is to obey, trusting that he has a perfect plan for our lives. And so this is, you know, so the demons get what they ask for. Does it work out well for them eternally? No. The people get what they ask for. Uh, is it good for them, that, for Jesus to leave their, their region, their country? No. The man asks for something. He wants to follow Jesus physically. He wants to literally physically go with him. Jesus says, no, I've got something better for you. Go and tell your people who God is, what I did for you. Why? Because that's the good news. Somebody in the community has to go tell the other people, right? If we are going to be faithful watchmen on the wall, if we are going to be faithful ambassadors, we can't just leave um, our place where God has put us and, and want to go do something else for the Lord. I mean, unless the Lord is taking us there. But in this case, who, who's going to reach these people that don't even want Jesus to be there except someone who can locally testify, hey, I'm one of you, but you knew who I was. I was in bad shape. I was trapped. I was you know, locked up with demons, and Jesus set me free. Let me tell you who he is. Let me tell you about my experience with Jesus. Another uh, important uh, observation I think you can draw out of this is it's actually a pattern of ministry uh, in the uh, Muslim world, and uh, particularly, you know, uh, well, throughout the Muslim world, particularly in the Arab world. But I think you could also say it's true in any part of the world, and including the Jewish part of the world. But there's a pattern in difficult places to share the gospel, and that is resistance, obedience, proclamation, and endurance. Okay? <coughs> the people were resistant. But Jesus told the man to be obedient. His job was to proclaim, right? To not be mute, to not be silent, to go warn the people of evil. If you let evil be part of you, there's a judgment. There's a, there's a, there's a cost. There's a price. And there's good news. There is a God who can set us free. That's the proclamation. But we also have to endure, right? We have to keep slogging. We have to keep serving the Lord and not grow weary in well-doing just because it's difficult. But that's also why we need to encourage one another, to come alongside one another, uh, to take a little time away from the battle and to laugh and to refresh and to study and to worship and then to get back into the game, back into the battle. That's, but this is the pattern in difficult places, uh, places that are hard, hardened to the gospel. Resistance, obedience, proclamation, endurance. That was certainly what was happening in this passage, and it's, it's happening uh, in the epicenter today. Now, why did Jesus cross the river? Why did he cross the Jordan River, right? Uh, didn't he once say, uh, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? I mean, that's a, that's a direct quote, Matthew 15, 24. That's what Jesus said, he had come to do, uh, is reach Jewish people, lost Jewish people. So he did say that. Why does he cross the river? Why does he cross the Sea of Galilee and, and cross the, 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 the river and, and then the sea, which is sort of the bulge in the river? That is the natural dividing line, in, in a sense, geographically, between you know, these two peoples, the two sides. And so why does Jesus cross it when there aren't Jewish people at the time on that side? I mean, there may have been people doing some business and traveling, but, you know, this was not, that wasn't Israel. And it's interesting. Well, he did, he did say that he was called to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but let's think of a couple points here. First, that lost sheep had largely rejected him, right? And the ancient prophecies, the Hebrew prophecies, made clear that his calling, Jesus' calling, was to save men and women from all tribes and tongues, not just Israel. And most Jews were rejecting him, and so he crossed the river to do some ministry. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, is very interesting because, again, the Lord is, is very specific in prophetically saying the father to the son through the prophet Isaiah what the Messiah's job description is. Isaiah 46, 49, verse 6. The Lord God said to his anointed one, the Messiah, 
it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. That's too small of an assignment. Yes, your assignment is to reach Jewish people, to reach the nation of Israel, and those that are called to, to come into the kingdom will respond. But that's not enough for the Jewish Messiah to do, says the Father to the Son. I, God says, I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. I love that Jesus is Jewish. I love that he came to Israel. I love that he has a plan for the lost sheep of the house of Israel because my father was one of those lost sheep. I was one of those lost sheep. My sons are part of those lost sheep. But the Lord came as the shepherd to, 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 to find us and to rescue us and bring us into the sheepfold. And I am super grateful for this. And I, as I said to you uh, earlier today, it is an act of anti-Semitism to deny a Jewish person the right to at least hear, to have an opportunity to hear that the Messiah has come and that he's coming again and that he brings uh, wholeness and forgiveness and atonement and life abundant and eternal to the nation of Israel and that his name is Yeshua. It's an act of anti-Semitism to hold it back and to deny Jews a chance to, make, to hear it, process it, and then make their decision once, one way or another. So I'm so grateful that part of the Messiah's job description was to do just that. But I'm also grateful that God said it's too small a thing just to reach one nation. I, I'm going to have you reach all the nations. And this is the prophecy of Isaiah 49. So why does Jesus cross the river? Well, because that's part of his calling. Yes, initially he was reaching the Jewish people. That's where, who he came to first. And, and, and Paul, in a sense, reflects that when he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, right? Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek, or that, in other words, to the, to, the, to the Gentile. So the gospel came to the Jews first, but, you know, Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. But then the gospel doesn't stop there. If, if Jews reject, the door opens to the Gentiles. But God hasn't given up on the Jews. So it's, it's, that's, that's, again, where we get this both and concept. And so Jesus was trying to reach the Jewish people, not getting a big response. But he begins the process of modeling for his disciples to cross the river, to go reach people on the other side. Now, it's interesting to me that, I mean, I think you have to ask, so, well, okay, are we, are we saying that only one person came to really know the Lord? Maybe two were rescued or liberated from their demon possession, but only one wants to follow him? And this is the one person that Jesus sends back to these 10 cities? So you're saying that Jesus crossed the river for one person? Yes. Yes. I mean, in a sense, he says, you know, uh, right? He gives us other analogies where he talks about, uh, you know, the, sheep, uh, the shepherd leaves the 99 to go find the one. Now, this one turns out to be very faithful. We don't get his name. We got the name of the demons. We don't get this person's name. I can't wait to meet this guy. This is like the first guy on the east side of the river that takes the gospel message and begins proclaiming it all through these 10 important Roman cities. And, uh, we were just in uh, Jordan uh, uh, just a couple months ago. We, uh, we had some friends that wanted to come and visit the Holy Land, and they had oh, their, their frequent flyer miles only allowed them to come into Jordan based on the flights that were still available. And they said, we'd like to spend a few days in Jordan touring, and then we can come to Israel and visit you guys, and you can show us around. We said, sure. But we thought, when are you coming, August? Uh, no, we don't want to travel through the blistering heat of Jordan um, during August, but we, we loved this family, and so we said yes. And so we took them around, and we went through the, 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 the country or the region of the Gerasenes, and we, we taught the kids this story while we were there. So with that backdrop, and a little bit of that context, that Jesus will, was willing to cross the Jordan River to go reach one person, that one person would follow him and that he would use that person to begin to take the good news to the rest of the people in that region. 
let's talk about what God is doing in the epicenter today. Uh, that's really what I want to talk about, some of the great things that God is doing uh, in the region and particularly on the other side of the river. And this brings us to the state of the epicenter portion of the program. Uh, look, we know how many horrible things are going on in the region, but there are some great things going on. And I want to underscore, the, 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 I think, the central verse, for this message at least, uh, which Jesus says, Yeshua says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 8, you know it, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is Yeshua's promise. This is his plan, is to build his church. It's the only thing of, of lasting value that he's building in this world. And one of the things we wanted to do as a, as a Joshua team was uh, in this year's conference was sort of try to understand, well, how many believers are there? Because the gates of hell have been trying for 2,000 years to keep anybody in that part of the world from coming to faith in, in Yeshua. And, and even now, you have genocidal conditions as the Islamic State is trying to slaughter or enslave uh, or forcibly convert anybody that calls themselves a follower of Jesus in the region. So there are a lot of demonic pressures coming against the believers uh, in the Middle East. So, so, so where are we with the, the church in this part, uh, for this part of the world? So let me give you some numbers, and we're going to uh, flash some of them up on the screen. This document, with all of its endnotes, uh, is posted, or will be soon, uh, at epicenterconference.com and at joshuafund.com. I'll probably be posting on the blog as well in the, in the next few days. So, but I think this is the first time we've ever walked through anybody with it. Uh, and we've been talking to ministry leaders throughout the region, uh, consulting all the known uh, stats and documents and books on this stuff and, and, and trying to get the most up-to-date numbers. So here's where we are. And I want to be clear. We, mean, we need to be careful with numbers, okay? Um, it, it's possible, and at times it happens, that some Western ministry leaders and local pastors can at times uh, be tempted to exaggerate uh, progress uh, to friends and to donors Likewise, uh, radical Islamists and, and uh, you know, religious Jewish anti-missionaries can report to their compatriots and their donors inflated numbers of Jews and Muslims who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus in, in order to, uh, to exaggerate a perceived threat to their communities. So, okay, so we, you know, we're trying to take that into account. But in interviews with a wide range of Arab and Messianic pastors and ministry leaders, again, uh, sort of scouring through all the, the, the known data that we can come up with, gives us a useful, if imprecise, snapshot of the state of the church in the epicenter right now. So beginning in Israel for a moment, uh, on, the, on the west side of the river, uh, based on a forthcoming study that Dr. Erez Soroff and his colleagues have been working on at Israel College of the Bible, we now believe there are between 25 and 30,000 Messianic uh, Jewish believers uh, uh, worshiping in Messianic congregations in Israel today, which is extraordinary because in 1948, when the state of Israel was reborn, uh, there, were, there were fewer than two dozen Jewish believers in Jesus in the nation of Israel, in the land of Israel. Fewer than two dozen. Okay, and we know many those that are still alive. We know, or I know many of them. Uh, Erez and, and the others know all of them. I mean, some of them are still still there. It's almost like for an American believer, it's like it's like meeting believers that walked off the Mayflower. Okay, I mean that's how extraordinary it would be if you could say so. Since the time of Jesus, there's been almost no followers of Jesus who are Jewish in the land, and you're the 20 or 22 or 23 people that do believe, and some of you still are alive, wow, how cool is it to meet you and hear your stories of what you've seen happen. So, you know, in your world, 25 or 30,000, that's like one church, right? But in that, if you think of where Jesus brought the gospel first, where the apostles, you know, preached the gospel first, the fact that there's 25 to 30,000 is pretty cool. This is pretty good when you look at the baseline, which was under, under 25, 
Now, among Arab evangelical Christians who are citizens of Israel, uh, we believe that about four to 5,000 of them uh, openly worship Jesus in Israel today. So again, is that a lot? It's not, but uh, as, you'll, as you drill into some of the end nodes, you'll see that, is, that does represent growth. Uh, but that's where we are right now. That's about the size of the believing body, the born-again body in Israel today. Now, in the Palestinian Authority, we believe there are about 1,000 to 1,500 Palestinian evangelicals living in the Palestinian Authority today. Now, uh, there are uh, about 200 to 250 Muslim background believers, MBBs, who live in the West Bank and Gaza. However, uh, you know, few of them actually attend an, ab an above-ground church, and a church that's openly uh, meeting because, uh, well, for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's, it's, it's their fear for their lives, not entirely sure if they're welcome among, um, among the nominal Christian believers who are now actually born-again believers. So there's a number of issues going on there. What's interesting is that there are, uh, in talking to the leaders, they believe there are, are well over 10,000 uh, and possibly as many as 30,000 Palestinian evangelical Christians who, have now, who are now living outside of the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, and, and many of them live in the United States, um, uh, Europe, uh, the Gulf region, or, or elsewhere. But what I think that tells us is that it, it, Palestinians are coming to faith in Jesus, but the, the, the conditions are so difficult that it's, it's hard, as, as you heard from Munir and Nihad and Mazda, it's hard to live there. So there's a great, I don't want to call it temptation, but there's a great interest, desire, uh, propensity to go find a job someplace, go get education someplace else, go breathe oxygen that feels a little freer and less you know, spiritual warfare, physical warfare, and so forth. Um, but that's the benchmark. That's the best that we can tell you at this point as how many believers there are. And again, when you look at four and a half million Palestinians, you think, wow, that's really not that many. True, but it's a lot more than there were 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So we're, this is hard ground. You've heard that said. I want to illustrate it by saying people are coming to faith. But this is not, but again, if you want to, uh, you know, invest in the work of the kingdom and you want big returns fast, then you want to be praying for and investing in the work in China and Brazil and Sub-Saharan Africa, among other places. This is slow going. And the Joshua Fund has a long-term perspective and we just have, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Jordan, let's cross the river. Okay, so Jordan, best as we can understand it, we've got, there are about between 10 and 15,000 evangelical Christians living in the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan today. And that is, a, that is a significant growth, even just in the last uh, five or 10 years. In addition, there are an estimated 10,000 Jordanian evangelical Christians residing outside the kingdom. And again, some of that is because uh, of a need to go find jobs and, um, and uh, educational opportunities and so forth outside. Some of that is that our, uh, Jordan, more than more, most areas, is, is also a sending country. Uh, they have a, pa uh, a passion and a vision in the Jordanian church to send the people, pastors and missionaries, to go reach other lands, other parts of the world. There's a wonderful seminary in Jordan. Um, and, and, and so there, was a, there are... It is a place with enough freedom and security under the, under the rubric of a Muslim king to, to train Christians, uh, and, they can, and they can and do deploy to other places. Uh, now, about more than 96% of Jordanians are Muslim. Uh, all told, there are about 145,000 Jordanians who would describe themselves as Christians. Um, these are mostly Catholic, but they also include uh, Greek Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, you know, and, and I don't want to get into a debate, are, are they born again or not? Uh, but most of the 145,000 don't identify themselves as evangelicals. Uh, they're part of the historic churches. So it's important to understand that and just have that as some context. Egypt. More than 86% of Egyptians are Muslim. 
uh, there are more than 11 million Egyptians who describe themselves as Christians. Again, the vast majority are Coptic Orthodox. Uh, of course, there are Catholics. Uh, but there are also 2 million uh, Protestant uh, Christians in uh, Egypt as well. You're saying, wow, that's, I mean, we're talking about millions compared to thousands. What's going on there? Well, Egypt has, had, has the, one of the deepest and longest Christian traditions of, of the gospel going there and taking root. We know that Mark, for example, the uh, not an apostle, but one of the early believers, took uh, the gospel to Egypt and uh, sort of established uh, a base camp for preaching and discipleship in uh, Alexandria. And that became a center of, of learning uh, for the believers uh, for, for many, many centuries to come. So uh, it's been a lot of hardships in being a believer in Egypt, uh, but God has grown that church. And Egyptian pastors uh, are, are, are spread out, Egyptian missionaries are spread out throughout the region. In fact, uh, some of the key people that are involved in satellite television broadcasting of the gospel and Bible teaching uh, around the region in Arabic are Egyptians. And so that's just interesting. Uh, one of them was here uh, last night, and I had a chance to meet her. I didn't know she was going to be here. In Syria, now, we believe there are between 21 and 23,000 evangelical Christians in Syria. But let me, you know, the biggest caveat I need to put on this is it's, it's impossible at this moment to know how many there are because the country is imploding. Uh, many have had to flee, but others are coming to faith. I had a chance to spend some time with uh, uh, one of the key pastors and leaders who, uh, in Syria uh, not long ago, and just hearing the number of people coming to faith in Christ uh, from multiple different uh, ethnic groups inside Syria, uh, not in spite of the violence, but because of the violence. These are Muslims who've been so shaken, so rattled, rattled by the, the evil the barbarity, the savageness that they're watching. They're, they are leaving Islam and they're coming to faith in Christ. And the satellite television broadcasts are planting seeds. Uh, they, if they have internet access, they're searching for more. And then they meet actual Syrian believers on the ground serving the Lord who haven't fled and they are coming into the kingdom and they are being discipled. And that is just extraordinary. Uh, and you have to put it in context. Again, uh, before the Civil War, there were 1.25 million people in Syria who called themselves Christian. Were they all born again? I can't say that. Uh, but today, there are fewer than uh, 500,000. So you can just see the effect of the genocidal conditions in Syria. In Iraq... Uh, I've actually never been to Syria. I've been to Iraq four times and, and began to build friendships there. And, and the Josh Fund works there as within these other countries. And today, there are between 1,000 and maybe 3,000 Iraqi evangelical Christians still living in Iraq. Uh, we believe, all told, there are about 53,000 Iraqi evangelicals. But most of them have left the country due to the 2003 war, the 2006 insurgency, the years that followed, the rise of ISIS after 2011. I mean, it's been a horror show in Iraq and in many levels, and, and just so many people have left. As you'll see, uh, before, uh, before all these uh, you know, last 15, 17 years of war, there were about 1.5 million people in Iraq who would call themselves Christians. Again, can't say that they were all born again, but these were people who said, I'm not Muslim, I'm not Jewish, I'm a Christian. Catholic, uh, Orthodox, uh, a, a range of historic uh, denominations. But today that number has dropped dramatically it's somewhere between two and 300,000. Again, of these, we believe it, it, it's a handful of those who would identify as evangelicals. And then Lebanon. We believe that there are between 15 and 21,000 evangelical Christians living in Lebanon. Uh, now, again, this is growth, but you also have to understand that only 60% of Lebanese people uh, describe themselves as Muslims. Historically, between 30 and 40% of the country would describe themselves as Christian, mostly Mar Maronite Catholic, but again, a, a wide range of other historic denominations. 
But because of civil war, uh, the Israeli invasion, uh, the rise of Hezbollah, and all kinds of other traumas, multiple wars, terrorism, uh, so many have left. And in terms of people who really would describe themselves as evangelicals, meaning, you know, what, what do we mean by that? That they, they openly describe themselves as born again and that they believe you're supposed to share the gospel with other people. That's a minimal definition of evangelical, but it's a reasonable working one. Uh, again, the, the, the numbers are not that big. We are seeing Lebanese people come to faith. And for, again, for a while, that's where the Bible colleges and the seminaries were. But the trauma of the last quarter century or more, half century, uh, has, has really uh, taken a toll. Now, is it possible that there are many more Muslim background believers in the epicenter than these numbers that I've given you reflect? Is that possible? Yes, it is possible. As a result of satellite TV and radio ministries, as well as the advanced and creative use of internet evangelism, Arab ministries in the region are seeing a growing number of Muslims coming to faith in Jesus Christ. A growing number of NCBBs as well, nominal Christian background believers. But, but this, especially we're seeing Muslims leave Islam and come to faith in Christ through the various forms of media. But that said, the precise numbers of MBBs are in, very difficult to assess and thus, we've only used conservative numbers uh, presented here in this document. But look, what is significant is not the precise numbers. What's significant are the trend lines, okay? What we're seeing is more prayers by the believers in the epicenter to reach their people. We're seeing more prayers among believers here in North America and around the world for the work of God in the epicenter, uh, that more people's hearts would be opened. We're seeing more boldness among local believers to share the gospel, and we're seeing unprecedented openness, or boldness, I'm sorry, we're seeing unprecedented boldness by the believers and unprecedented openness among uh, Jews and Arabs, um, and more Jews and Arabs are actually making the decision, yes, I'm placing my faith in Jesus Christ, and even being baptized. This is extraordinary. I would say there's more openness than fruit, meaning more people are watching satellite television, pre, pre, uh, uh, you know, watching these internet videos and, and processing it, both on the Arab and Jewish side, then you could say, okay, that person has made a decision. But this is a game-changing moment in terms of the openness and the technology that allows the openness. Now, Fewer people can go reach more people. So can I tell you all of the church of the Middle East wants to reach Muslims and Jews? I wish I could say that. I can't say that. Can I say that all the North American and global church wants to reach Jews and Arabs with the gospel? I wish I could say that. I can't say that. But I can say if you take a, a shofar, you know, the ram's horn, you don't blow through the large end. You blow through the, the small end and it makes a large sound. Okay, A small number can have a big impact now because of the power of the Holy Spirit and the dramatic, almost miraculous use of technology today. And therefore, despite such darkness in the region, I, I believe, and our team believes at the Joshua Fund, we believe that we should be encouraged, we are encouraged, we think you should be encouraged by evidence of God's faithfulness. The Lord Jesus Christ is building his church in the epicenter, and he is refusing to allow the gates of hell to prevail against it, just as he promised. Let us rejoice in that, and uh, amen. Subscribe to our videos by clicking the subscribe button. You'll find some videos that we've chosen specifically for you. And if this is a ministry that you'd like to support financially, just make a tax deductible donation by clicking here to visit our giving page. Thank you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.